So I'll be your host for the next 40 minutes. Um, and we're going to talk about um, development of e-learning in Malawi. Will this assist bringing quality, affordability uh, to education? That's the question. So in the end, we will answer. But being academic, we will not just answer yes or no. We have to go through some uh, methods to get to there. So let's look at the content. This, I'm going to put a problem statement. What I think is the problem out there that we're trying to solve, or we could attempt to solve through e-learning. And then I'm going to look at open and distance and e-learning. How does it fit into trying to solve that um, um, uh, problem? And then we're going to look at the benefits of e-learning. And then I'll ask the question whether we have an enabling environment for e-learning in Malawi. And then we'll look at uh, what could be the way forward. So problem statement. I will start with the quote there. Somebody said, capacity in brick and mortar structures in vessels will never be enough to accommodate all school leavers and to give them all the quality and affordable education. And this could be true because when you read the Malawi Growth and Development Strategy 3 on the education sector, it highlights two main problems. That in Malawi, as of 2017, unemployment is bigger than 20%. And added literacy is only 65%. Which means 35% of Malawians are illiterate. And remember, the definition of illiteracy in Malawi is very basic. What do we say? Illiterate means what? Can't read and write. Just reading and writing. <laughs> yeah. 35% means three to four people out of every ten cannot read or write. Imagine. It's a big problem. And most of these are already old. So we'll come to that. And then if you look at the down there, the statistics, this is even worse now. If you look at uh, 2015, 2016, from four, those who wrote were almost 140,000. And out of those, those who passed away about 80,000. But those that got selected to teach education are only 4,000. Out of 140,000. This is appalling, right? This is appalling. And the percentage you can see, selected out of total is only 3%. And the selected out of those who qualified to go to university, only 5% were selected. That's why we have all these debates, should we have quota, maybe not, maybe yes. Because the numbers are appalling. Even now, 2017, 2018, almost 20,000. So the number is increasing now. From 140, now at 20,000. It's not go down. So it will be half a million. And those who qualified for MSC were 124,000. Those who went to Selective University are only 4,700. In two years of jump, they've tried to jump a little bit by 700, but it's not enough. The percentages are even smaller. Why? Because the increase there is much bigger and faster than what we're trying to do in academic. This already is beginning to ask our question. Because it means we're not building enough bedrooms and lecture theaters to accommodate the kind of growth we're talking about there. Because remember, the population of Malawi, how many people are we going to add to Malawi population next year? Who can guess? Net addition, how many? How much? No adding. 18. 18 million will be the target, right? Yeah. Okay, 2020, how many do you think will be? It'll be 20 million, according to the projections. From next year, we're going to be adding 1 million people every year. In 2025, we'll be 25 million people, my We'll we not know where to step. Even here, there'll be people on the floor here. <laughs> you know, somebody was joking, he was saying that, um, maybe this is not a very good joke, but it's not very bad. <laughs> You know, also must talk hygiene. You see, when people drive to Blanda and Bilongwe, in the past, some of the crazy men would just urinate everywhere. Nowadays, they can't, because there's nowhere where there's no people. <laughs> Have you noticed? <laughs> now, which, this is the advantage of good population, because people now cannot urinate everywhere. <laughs> so that's the one advantage. <laughs> but the disadvantage is that many. <laughs> you know, for every, every bad, there's a good. <laughs> so that's the problem statement, that Unemployment is big, the literacy is not doing well, the number of from four students is growing faster than we can increase, than Inche is doing. I've seen Inche officials, Mr. Chinula and the others, 
They are trying to increase access and doing all those things, but Mr. Jinwa, you don't catch up with the 20,000. <laughs> now, here I come. Darwin told us it is not the strongest of species that um, survives, but the most adaptable, right? So this is the challenge we have. It means the old means that we're doing cannot adapt with the changing world. We've got to do things differently. I remember when I was a um, union leader in college, uh, we had a strike against the Chikaunda raise fees, may so far, so SNPC had good intentions. I raised fees from 1,500 to 46,000 kwacha. And we rose against that, we protested, what, until it was brought down to 25,000 kwacha. And my mentor, John Ryan, now Bishop of Zoo's Diocese, he kept telling me, but when you grow up, you will say that what you're doing is not correct. <laughs> um, don't, the media don't quote this. I think Ryan was right. <laughs> but that time I was doing my job. I mean, as soon as we were leader, I had to defend, we had to defend our rights. You know, everything is relative. Everything is relative. In what I was doing, I was right. I don't I have no regrets. And I don't, uh, for that time, I was correct. For now, we need to really expand and open up. <laughs> it depends where you're standing from. Yeah? But the question is that it is the most adaptable of species that survive. Is Malawi as a species? Is Malawi as a personality adaptable? Are we flexible? If we are not, we will not survive as a country. And that's why one of the biggest CEOs in the world, Jack Welch, said, change before you have to. Never be happy where you are. Get a crash at your company that loves change. And every time there is a quantum change, you must jump with it or before it happens. Now, meanwhile, here is the Unicaf offering wonderful programs of healing and all that. And Malayans are saying, ah, come as if it's almost a twenty thousand class. Meanwhile, I hear Nigerians are coming here to learn here. Zambians are here learning. The time you realize they've already taken their degrees, you go back now to study your degree, those guys are doing masters. The time you're trying to graduate, they're now doing PhD. You go for masters, they are now teaching you. You see? You say, I'm my classmate. <laughs> so what? <laughs> we need to wake up. The media, this one you can quote. <laughs> so we must go with the change. So what is the Malawi growth strategy saying about this problem? It is saying Malawi needs to improve transition rates from primary to secondary, and also from secondary to tertiary. We already saw from secondary to tertiary, it was roughly how much percentage? We saw there, 4%, 5%, right? Not much. Now it's coming towards 2, 3. Please, Mr. Gino, don't bring it to 1%. <laughs> Try your best. Keep it at 2. And then, here the government is saying, in 2017, approximately 16% of children transitioned from primary to secondary. There's a problem there too. I said, bigger problem. Because these ones are not even, they are barely illiterate. Because I know some, some people listen, they did not be able to read or write. It's true. Me, I didn't know how to read and write until I was four. Like my mother was a primary school teacher. She would give me a book, read here. And my mother would have the book and I would be like reading. But because she was a teacher, she knew that I just memorized. I do not read. She said, no, no, read here. Let me give you a different page. Give me a different page. I go and said, no, come here, my son. So I started teaching here at home. That's how I learned reading and writing. How many here knew to read and write before properly, not memorize, before the Sun 5? What's the different question? Okay, after Sun 5? <laughs> Those of us who knew how to read and write in Sun 4, I'm the only one. <laughs> yeah? And then we are saying from secondary to university, to tertiary rather, tertiary is only 8%. Now you may ask, you say, but that was 4%. But that 4% did not include the longer technical college, uh, TTCs, and all those other, yeah? So when you put in those, then it only takes us to 8%. And I don't know whether I include it here, but they say also that uh, school leavers who do not proceed beyond secondary end up unemployed. So it means while we're trying to solve literacy, education, try to push most of these school leavers into tertiary, they will not be employed. And what do they do? They stay in the village. And you've seen them when you go to the village. Eh? Your classmates who have not gone beyond the phone for what do they do? The first thing you come there, they say, ah, the big man, Uncle Wambi. <laughs> <laughs> you already know what they're looking for, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's not much. How much? 
right? 80%. 80%. So 80% of 18, that's a lot. That's uh, nearly, I don't know, 15 million, thereabouts. Those guys, they only work. I am a great children in Pano, eight, November. <laughs> the rainy season, when does it stop? March, right? Mm -hmm. So November, December, January, February, March, five months. 80% of your country is working less than half of the time. Not even half of the time, because half of the year, right? Five months. And during that five months, they go to the field uh, a quarter of the time. So a quarter of half of half. <laughs> <laughs> Do your body mass. It's the point zero zero something, yeah? Of the eighty percent, so it means the twenty percent of us who tipu tipula, we can't go far. We're carrying this huge load. Then, therefore, how can we have good hospitals with drugs? Okay, corruption is another big monster, but I mean that that is given. But we need to remove corruption. We can't go far with this. So we, as academia, as scholars, we must be looking at these things. Police can say, what can we do to solve this problem? That's why. You find that the government in the MGDS have said open and distance learning and interactive radio instruction. They have listed it as a solution for access to basic education. Don't do that at primary level. What is, I found interesting is I did not find ODL for, for secondary education. But in Tesha, they mentioned it indirectly. They have said to improve access and equity to tertiary education, we will provide alternative methods of higher education. I think those alternatives include. Uh, e-learning and other distance and open distance education. Now the, the question is, it means in primary you learn through e-learning and open and distance, then secondary you go brick and mortar, then in university you go back to, uh, there I don't know what you were thinking, maybe it was, um, uh, we need to tell them to, to look at that. <laughs> but uh, the point here is that even the government is thinking about open and distance and e-learning. In fact, I think the government are setting up um, an open university. Yeah, yeah, I think I heard that, yeah, they're, they're doing that. And even the government universities, Mzuzu University is uh, going bigger, that Luana is even bigger. Um, I think University of Malawi, they're trying to think about it. Um, but being University of Malawi, although I was there myself as a student, but I think they are a bit slower. Um, we must name the elephant in the room. Uh, they think they're big, but you know, when you think they're big, you quickly find that the small guy overtakes you, eh? You need to be very careful. And they should come here and see what Junkaf is doing. <laughs> right, so now let's look at the open distance and e-learning. So, in terms of definition, distance education is education of students who may not always be physically present. They may be in a way. We'll come to the modes of that. And traditionally, this was through correspondence. Remember MCD, Malawi? No, at least of what? MCC? Yeah. What was MCC before? Marine Correspondence College. So it was uh, correspondence. And we also had the Agri Memorial School. Was it not correspondence also? Yes. 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 Uh, by DDP. I think it is still there in um, <laughs> Trade Fair, right? Yeah, yeah, it is still there. And you find him going there with his umbrella and his big jacket. <laughs> um, and then modern days, it's even online. And this could be blended, which I'm told the UNICAF is doing a lot of it, where students will learn both online as well as with the face of face and hybrid too. The difference being just the emphasis where you emphasize more on online and more on, um, on face to face. Or flipped classroom. This is where students will first of all go and read on their own online and what, then they come just to fill in the gaps for specific times. And then you may have also the 100% distance uh, learning, which is also part of what UNICAF um, uh, does here. So as a history, there's two parts three. In America, there was a guy uh, called uh, Caleb Phillips who put in the Gazette of Boston in 1928. He said, teacher of new method of short hand. And uh, he was teaching them his my post office. He was learning his, his lessons. And uh, in the UK as well, in 1840s, Sir Isaac Pittman also was using um, a, a remote post to teach shorthand. The only difference that for him, he, was, he had elements of feedback from the students, which made it more enriched. And uh, how many of us have ever taken Pittman's exams or presentations? 
Am I the only one? <laughs> oh, there's one there. Thank you. I'm 40, but you won't make me look old. <laughs> I had this one in 1998. It was um, Bishop Bryant who was teaching us computers then, and I wrote Pittman's uh, examinations from the UK uh, in the room. They were posted. I wrote my exams. We posted again. Two weeks later, we got results that I passed. <laughs> By the way, that certificate, because I have so much emotion to it, it is still on my CV. <laughs> the certificate is never small. I mean, I squared it for the exam. <laughs> so some of the benefits of open and distance um, uh, and e-learning, uh, e one, you expand access to education, because you're not limited to brick and mortar. And then you have the time flexibility. How many of us? are working, but also doing some study. Hands up. You see, thank you. You see, because UNICAF has given you that flexibility that in the evening, at weekend, at your own time, at 4 a.m., you can do your study. You should not be limited with the going to class at 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Nobody will give you leave for the whole year, you know, to do study. So it gives us that flexibility. And then even space, because it means if you are transferred now suddenly to go and work in Doha, you still continue. Or transfer to Sanjay, you still continue. But imagine if you are brick and mortar and studying at Chester College. The moment they transfer your wife to Chitipa and you're supposed to follow wife, then you stop your degree. <laughs> so you have to choose between stopping the degree or risking the marriage. <laughs> and then this one is very important access to academic experts. Um, Mr. Pando was telling me that uh, most of their faculty are not even here in Lilongwe. Some are within Malawi, Zomba, Blanta, everywhere. You're not limited to Lilongwe. And even abroad. So it means they're able to get the best person for that subject. They're not limited by that. You know, you can imagine the challenge the University of Minnesota have. Somebody may be very qualified to teach economics at the University of Minnesota, but if he thinks now of Golomo, what do you call that? Goloj. Ah, so I'll be climbing that thing, no, but he'll be driving. <laughs> yeah. So there's a challenge. But if they have e-learning, that becomes no problem, right? So you have access to academic experts drawn from all over the world. And then you have a broader diversity of students. You see, when I was at Poly, my class was 72 engineers, engineering students, six girls and uh, uh, the rest boys. All of us from Sanjay to Chitipa and um, uh, Salima to change that was all. But here, opportunity uh, to have egress in your class on online. <laughs> so you say, say, what's the benefit of studying at Unica? Box in our class of egress, five egress. <laughs> <laughs> so you learn another culture as well. You see, when you learn with the, a bit of people that you, are from you outside your background, you learn even more. You learn even more. You know, um, for me, the first time I went beyond, um, not even gender, I'm trying to think what the, beyond the Mzimba and Katabe was when I was 18 from three. When I went to Zomba, luckily I passed well mathematics, so I went to do the finals at National Level from three. <coughs> So I reached there. By the time I was not enough to reach Blanda, I tried hard to reach Blanda. I already booked express bus. <laughs> I asked, well, but how far is Blanda? I said, no, no, it's just one hour. <laughs> so one hour to go, one hour there, one hour back. Three hours from there, the express bus at 7 p.m. Sharp. Okay, so when, so then now I, I go to read hard and go to Poly. I was in Blanda. So I did that and I go to Poly, and that was the first time I went to Blanda. For me, that was the first time I went to Blanda. <laughs> Chatosa, when you went to Zomba Champo, was that the first time you went to Chatosa? I've been there for a friend that I've been there. But maybe he's ashamed. <laughs> Me, it was the first time. Yeah. It was my first so, time. Sorry? It was my first time. It was, it was your first time. You see, he's confessing also. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. So you find that uh, oh, we have to take over that distance. Yeah? But, in our class, we didn't have that diversity. Our friends here have the enhanced diversity of learning with people from all the different backgrounds. And when I came to Blanda now, I made friends from all over places, what? And uh, now, 
I even learned to teach better now. I speak much better. I don't have no way. Now they will say, list your languages. I say English, Chichewa, Chitumbuka, and a bit of Latin. Uh, I can read and write Latin. And so, yeah, but within the cultures, you bombard yourself. When I went to Oxford, this was even more, because here in Poland, our cultural differences were very minor. But when I went to Oxford now, I had people from America, from uh, India, from all over, and what? Uh, many things, and I can tell you one very quickly. Uh, so when I arrived there, the first day our professor said, there was me and a friend from uh, Pakistan, and the professor gave us, he said, go and read about uh, spread spectrum techniques and code division multiple access systems. So we went in the library and looked everywhere, never found anything, two days. <laughs> <laughs> nothing about those things, nothing in the books. Try that. Then we friend who agreed. Zunu said, ah, but this agreed, deal. We tell him on Thursday, he said, we meet him on Thursday, that we can't find anything. Deal, deal, yes, both of us, yes. So I went to London to see a friend, Thomas Ngoma. He's an, he's an engineer, trained in my life, but been a broken day, yes. I stayed with him for two, three days. He said, but the school, you need to go. And I said, no, 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 you know, we can't find any books who report back to the professor. He said, who do you agree? I said, a friend from Pakistan. He said, no, 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 no. A Pakistan guy told you this? <laughs> he's cheating you, he's reading. <laughs> Find it. <laughs> but then you know that you find, let me take you back to Oxford now. Let's go to Oxford. Go dig more what? So I went back. I did dug a little more, and then I found a few just definitions somewhere and what. So we come to the professor. The professor says, "Yeah, did you dig this? this did you find?" Then my friend goes first. He says, "Yeah, with Matthew we didn't find anything. But just last night I found a little bit." Here. <laughs> <laughs> when he finished, then I said, "Yeah, me too. Last night I found a lot more." <laughs> I don't mind some man. So I learned. I learned from then that be careful doing deals. Be careful doing deals. Be very careful doing deals. Be very careful. So I learned that in big time. So you are learning that by having igwes. They also learn you. <laughs> and then the issue of affordability, you know, becomes cheaper because you don't have to have too many lecturers, you don't have to have too many lecture theatres, accommodation will come to that later. Optimize quality, we talk about access to uh, academic experts so you can have quality, but also uh, the curriculum can be shown because now the designers of uh, programs can be creative. And then commercial benefits, we'll look at that in terms of how uh, the cost structure is optimized. <coughs> So e-learning, in particular now, as the component of ODL, refers to the cognitive science principles of effective multimedia learning using electronic educational technology. Just as a matter of definition, but I think we all know that this is basically about learning through online. And um, now I want to look at uh, the two uh, uh, approaches to technologies using ODL. First is synchronous. This is where all students are present at the same time. They all be logged on at the same time. Although it's online, but they're all logged on at the same time. It resembles a classroom teaching method, despite people being located remotely. And therefore, you require a timetable because you have to know when to be together online. And examples of this, what they use, web conferencing, video conferencing, television, internet, radio, and streaming, as well as voice over internet, like Skype. Things, yeah? And then asynchronous is where now the participants can access their materials on their own schedules. One of them will be there at 4 p.m., the other one at 4 a.m., etc. Like we used to use to do in those old days when we had, uh, I remember in electronics, we had one book, Gaonka. We were at 28 in electrical engineering, year five. <coughs> when you have exams, the book became golden. And um, you know, as I said, for everything that is bad, there is a good to it. We learned how to read fast. We can finish a book in three hours. Because that's the time we had. That one book, six of us would do schedules. We are maximum my point was, uh, was uh, our good student in our class because he's in UK now working there. Maximum Mapenda was the guy who would read it the time everybody was asleep. So the guy was taking the book around the 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. My schedule was the 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. 
And then Choma Mikeka was 6 a.m. to 8 o'clock. He's now lectured at Chasabu Doka Mikeka. So they are lying like that. Victor Chisano was 10 o'clock to midnight. He said to me, and, <laughs> and then you go and uh, when somebody's asleep, you just quietly open the door. Wouldn't lock our doors. Eh? Security was okay. And you, you call it that time. He comes quietly and puts the, the book there. And, but uh, with this, you don't need that. Um, um, uh, uh, with, with the uh, technology and the open and distance learning. Now let's look at access versus um, e-learning. I want to argue that uh, e-learning is ubiquitous. It's ubiquitous because I work in mobile uh, industry and we talk about mobile industry, especially 4G, as A, B, C, always best connected. Okay, sometimes you get code drops and those issues. We'll talk about those later. For now, let's talk theory. <laughs> Always disconnected. So it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Actually, coverage of Airtel is about 80% on land. We'll come to that later. So we cover a lot of uh, land. A lot of people are covered with technology. Therefore, wherever there's technology, you can learn. And then flexibility we don't talk about. That's a big advantage. So it means People who otherwise the time would not have allowed them to do it. Even a mother who has a 60 month old baby can study when the baby is asleep in her own bedroom. So that's not, no longer a challenge. Scalable capacity. It becomes easy to add the 1,000 more, more people. The poly has to build more libraries or chance college. They won't be able to do that. Here we don't. Do you have hostels here? You don't need them, do you? Yeah. So before poly says, in Poly, I'm, I'm on a council for Catholic University. Last year, we, after a lot of efforts, I think we added the bed space for about 200. It was a lot of effort and a lot of money, not just 200. <coughs> but UNICAF, I was talking to the head of marketing, he was saying uh, by next month we'll add so many hundreds. It, to him, it's very easy. It was a scalable capacity. It's very easy. So therefore, access becomes very easy to enhance. And I'm saying that this menu, Archaeology to zoology, you can do that. A to Z of courses, business. Right now we have education, business, computer science, etc. But they'll be adding, the menu will be expanding all the time very easily. Affordability versus e-learning. I want to argue that by removing brick and mortar, you make it cost efficient. And then removing accommodation. Well, this may look simple. A friend of mine at Airtel has two daughters learning at the University of Namibia. I met him three weeks ago at the airport. It was a welcoming event. And um, so I said, how much, how much expensive is it to, to train them at the University of Namibia? He says, actually, fees is not very expensive. I said, oh, so is it travel? He said, no, accommodation, he said. <laughs> and he told me the numbers. Among us. Like there are two daughters, so you got one room, they share, and then the costs are better. Uh, but usually, even uh, at Nzuzu University, I think we tried to, we got a, a proposal from one of the financial institutions, pension funds, We're trying to build a hostel there. The proposal they made to us was that the students should be paying 100000 per month. We told them, are you also living in Malawi? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are you like, really? Now, students, I know typically a semester is 16 weeks, right? They're about plus minus 16 to 18. Four months. So it means one semester will be half a million. Another student is half a million. So a total of one million, is, uh, these days they're very young, 16, 15 year old. So you spend one million for the sleeping of 15 year old. And if he's a uh, boom you know he'll be sleeping. He's there just four hours. <laughs> I think you should be paid as you go. What do you think that was? <laughs> I think you should be paid as you go. Are you boom Yeah, or okay, you pay 50%. <laughs> like the barber shops. No, they're not fair. They just look at the head, they charge the same class. <laughs> what about the bald headed guys? <laughs> No, just 25 percent hair. <laughs> and the five minutes the guy is done and he says two thousand women. It's not fair, is it? Yeah. And then some of us like me with a very big head, you still charge the same way. <laughs> Add more. Say ah, two more that over three thousand. So we should do the same. And then I'm arguing that apart from accommodation costs. The travel cost. This one I'm comparing with like block release, for example. <coughs> I have a friend in Karonga. He's, uh, he's doing master's in theology at Chancellor College, uh, Benjamin uh, Sawyer. He got his bachelor's with distinction. He's working for Karonga Diocese. The diocese allowed him to be going there. He goes there every 
I think almost every month or every two months. And he has to travel from Karonga to Chansa College. That's, and for Malawi, it's not just the travel cost, but also the risk. Mm. True, yeah? Mm. They, if this, this, before you travel, the night before, you're praying for your travel tomorrow. <laughs> At eating, you're praying. <laughs> when you wake up, you pray. <laughs> At breakfast, you're praying for the trip. <laughs> and you go in the car, you start thinking, no, 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 I'll tell the church. Sorry? And the church, eh? <laughs> what did you say? I'll tell the church that you are guest pray. No? Oh, don't tell the priest. <laughs> yeah, and, and then, so that's the travel cost and risk. And then you were saying continuation of gainful employment. A lot of you have said you work and you study. So it's possible yourself. Without this kind of arrangement in the past, you'd have been to be applying for scholarships, applying for scholarships. Five years in your degree scholarship. You went for what? Save some money. And then we're saying lower teaching costs. Because now the teacher to student ratio is enhanced. Because one professor now can handle more with the uh, open and especially the e So it saved money. What about quality? According to international standards uh, organization, quality is the totality of features and the characteristics of a product or service that bears its ability to satisfy stated or implied needs. So when a student comes here, he, has, he or she has their needs. They may be what they expect, they may be what we imply or what we state. Now the question is, are we Given the totality of the features that will bear the ability to satisfy those needs. That's the question. So it doesn't matter whether it's brick or mortar or e-learning. The question is, are we satisfying the needs? And the people want to know. They want knowledge, but they also want to interact and network. So if they're able to know, apply the knowledge and network and become more confident, there they are. And let's go back to the basics of knowledge. Yes, the body of knowledge is important, but what is much more important is learning to learn and becoming confident. When uh, we were having graduation ceremony from Zuzu University 2016 at uh, BICC, I was up front there. We started with diplomas, bachelors, masters. Uh, did you have a picture there? We had, uh, no, we had the master of distinction. You could literally see to be honest, and watch at graduation next time. The diploma people, when they're going, they're calling their name, Matthews and Tembuga, diploma in engineering. Get it. <coughs> when they say, Richmond Chatose Chinula, bachelor's degree. <laughs> <laughs> when they say now, Isiagi, masters with distinction. <laughs> Now I can't imagine for PhD, the levels are changing. <laughs> Confidence levels have changed automatically. <laughs> automatically. Remember that advert of uh, Isaac and Jacobo? They said one million tambara. Then they said, that's some girl with my ad. Remember? That's some girl with my ad. I mean, that's some girl with my ad. The guy is confident. He's got one million dollars. At one time, one million dollars was a lot of money. Eh? <laughs> when you put the question, I think it's 10,000 or somewhere there. It's not big money. Today, that time was big money. He said, that's something to my head. I'm, I'm no longer like you. <laughs> like I always say, you know, you know, things, the way things happen is that um, in the army, you are brigadiers or whatever. The moment the general retires, and out of the trend of you brigadiers, one of you becomes general. He's no longer your friend. He's no longer like you. That's it. <laughs> so that's what happens. It changes everything. Now, are we delivering that value? The need that gives confidence. It gives the confidence. When I was leaving Oxford, my professor said, My PhD was on uh, multiple antennas on mobile phones, which now we may not know, but most mobile phones now have multiple antennas. So that's what I contributed to for 4G. And he said, This is 20 to 205. You live in 2005, your technology will be used in 2012. 
After that, it will be obsolete. It will no longer be state of the art. So what you are learning will not remain with you. What will remain with you is that there are three things. First, the confidence. Second, able to solve problems. Third, he said, learning to learn things. And that's what this education here should be doing. If we're able to deliver this, then we have quality. Even on e-learning, it doesn't matter whether they bring water or not. Now, I argue that uh, e-learning is best positioned to do this because you have access to the best of experts all over the world. Uh, you commented about the network quality in some places is a problem. Um, I agree. Uh, the good news is that both Airtel and TNM have now moved a lot to, towards 4G. But what happens is uh, with e-learning, most of the stuff you're doing is downloads and all that. When you're talking, it's easy with the old generation of the mobile telephone. When you are doing data and things, you need 4G or advanced 3G. In the beginning, those were only mostly in the city centers and big towns only. When you go further afield, then that became a problem. The good thing is both of them are expanding those a lot. Every week, every day, they're deploying more. So I think in the next 18 months, two years, we should be seeing. Before you graduate, which year are you? First year. First year. By the second, third year, if you see have challenges, come to here and talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then uh, worked on Bina, a uh, PhD candidate. Um, the, you suggested that it could be annual by annual physical conference where all the e-learners can meet to exchange ideas but also to convey feedback to them. I think that fits into what uh, Sir, Will, uh, Sir Pittman in the UK did where he had feedback from his students. And when I was coming here, I was asking the same to the faculty, I was saying maybe we could have a conference here and then. Um, I don't think it would cost you much because it would be them, uh, it would be the willing, conference of the willing, you know, not everybody, but those who can manage and afford and, you know, I think it's something they could think about, maybe not immediate, but I'm sure they are listening. Um, they're very nice people, I'm sure. And then, Kongwani uh, Mshari, your question is very tough. How can you make the pre Google people, how can you program, develop programs that can be friendly to them? I think that um, the best way, I'm IT also, I work in IT. I think the best way is to meet a few of the pre Google people. Meet those who are already doing well separately to understand how they went through that challenge. Very methodical, I'm talking about details on how and why they would do that. And then, um, because I know a gentleman who learned WhatsApp at the age of 83, 82, and he's very good at WhatsApp, and I chat with him more every day. And he's very good with it. So with people like that, you want to learn from them how they're able to. And then people who don't want even to learn. Because my dad, he doesn't even want to learn. So he begins from a wife and you want to learn. And as we do in IT, we say, we ask why five times. When say, ask her five times. You know, the real point is, ah, it's a very simple one. So then you fix that problem. So once you know why they're having those challenges, why they don't like that, then you understand. Then you can now develop your program, which can now be turned into those kind of people. So I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, first year, second year? First year. First year. The, first, the next uh, um, assignment will give you a project for IT. <coughs> this is the problem statement. Yeah, do it. If you don't have a supervisor, I, I volunteer to be your supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> the e-learning practical. Um, what, how can it benefit somebody who is a nurse like you? Uh, I think it is. Um, you see, what happens with life is that, um, in my case, I did engineering. The job I'm doing is um, IT. Uh, Enrique Kadambo, he was the boss of Chatose. Uh, he's one of the best marketing people in Malawi, right? Chatose, you agree with me? Uh, try to guess what was his bachelor's degree. Agriculture. Agriculture Bunda. <laughs> yeah. Chatose was our, our number two market at, Paul, at uh, Airtel, number two to Kadambo. In university, in university, Chatose read, was it statistics and economics? We were classmates with Saulos. So what, what did you study? Statistics. statistics. He's a statistician, but he became a marketing expert. Now he's an education expert at Nche. You see, what I'm trying to say there is life is very, very interesting. You, as a nurse, you are very young, or well, you look young, um, and I think you are. So you have a long life ahead of you. You look at programs which can in some way relate to what you do. Because the practical, to be honest with you, I don't think, what did you do your training to become a nurse? You went to which institution? 
comes great and says, have a bachelor's or diploma? Bachelor's. You have a bachelor's. So the practical side, you already know. What if I challenge you, because I know they do pro programs in business here. Why don't you learn a business degree? Then later on you set up your own clinic. I mean, think big. We're talking about employment in Malawi, right? Come here, learn business program, then start your, um, so Emine and Daughters Clinic. <laughs> you start it because you have learned here finance and all that kind of thing. So just think outside the box, see how you can blend these things and become better. Yeah? Programs, I was talking about, uh, I didn't talk about it. Uh, when I finished my PhD, I did one year open and distance learning with Open University in the UK. I started law for one year because I thought I wanted to become a leader in the future. And as a leader, I thought as an engineer, I need a little bit of accounting and a little bit of law. One year was enough for me. I don't need a degree. I did a certificate. That's enough. So when I meet lawyers and what in Bodrum and NBS, I am legally aware. So it's adding value to me. NBS Bank wanted a, an IT person who can sit in the boardroom. There are many people who do IT in Malawi, but only my name was picked. Perhaps those are the kind of things which help me to get that opportunity, you know? Mm -hmm. So it adds value. But uh, I thank you so much for being a very good audience. I've enjoyed collaborating with you. Thank you.